everybody, and welcome to the Satisfied God Podcast. This is Raven Bird. I appreciate you listening and uh, downloading this new episode. I uh, appreciate also those of you who are communicating with us and uh, sharing your thoughts on the on the different episodes and uh, how they're uh, helping you. Uh, it's really an encouragement. Uh, William, I got your letter and... and I certainly appreciate it very much. Uh, as I said, these things are an encouragement to me, guys. I, I love hearing from you. I appreciate you taking the time to write me and to text me. And to those of you who are helping uh, financially, uh, that's appreciated as well very much. Uh, it's it's good to know that, that you're out there and are being blessed by this, um, you know, this very simple outreach. I uh, hope it's hope it continues to be a blessing and uh if there's if there's more of a way it can be and something we can do more there's still some ideas that i have that i want to do it's just um uh, it's going to take a little time to get those things ironed out but um just thanks for being there and continue to reach out to me um in in the ways that you're doing it text emails phone calls uh letters however uh, I certainly appreciate it, and thank you guys uh, for the encouragement. Uh, we're going to just pick up uh, where where we've been looking in Romans. We've been in chapter 8, and basically we're just kind of introducing chapter 8. Uh, been looking basically in the last couple of times uh, together at verse 1 of Romans 8. And considering describing in in you know the 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 I guess the small way that we can the comprehensiveness of this statement there is therefore now no condemnation in Christ. Remember in the last podcast uh, I explained that the interlinear Bible will show that this verse is to be more literally read without reference to those in Christ, um, showing that the certainty, in other words, to be literally read, it should be read not uh, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ, but that there is no condemnation in Christ. And that shows that the certainty of the condition being addressed here in chapter 8 Um, in contrast with that condition that he described in chapter 7, cannot the validity and the substantiation of it, it cannot ever be seen with reference to those in Christ, but always with reference to the place or the man in whom those are found. Never the men in Christ, never those in Christ, but always the one, the Christ in whom they are found. There's where that state, the no condemnation, nothing missing, nothing lacking. You know, a state where he can call, uh, say in, 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 uh, first Corinthians, that he is declaring the wisdom of God that to those who are perfect, those type of statements and the absoluteness that they described can never be de- declared when man, flesh and blood is the reference point ever. And, and, and that's why it seems to me we have such a problem with those statements. And we like to put a lot of qualifications on those statements, and we like to make it uh, maturity. But there are so many different ideas as to the maturity and the levels, and then we build all these levels. Listen, when we're talking about those who are made perfect in Christ, those who are perfected forever by one uh, offering, that by one offering he has perfected forever those who are sanctified. Guys, that is never, th- those things never have us as its point of reference. It never makes us the object or the objective of those words. It describes a condition that is brought about by being found in 
Christ himself because Christ himself determines the sufficient and secure and comprehensive nature of the salvation of your soul. Now, that's a poor way of saying it. <laughs> but right now, that's all I can say. It's 11.30 at night here, so I'm, my mind's a little uh, <clears throat> tired. But so... Again, it, it goes back to the to the statement, and we'll get to it in, in 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 Romans eight, where he says, "How shall he who offered up his own son? How shall he not with that son? That means in union with that son, freely give us all things." Describing that in that son, all things are not only found, not only real, but are provided and fully furnished to the soul. We dealt with it in the last class looking at Peter. I think Second Peter, the first chapter, or the, uh, somewhere in the first chapter, where it says, add to this, this, like add to faith, patience, and patience, temperance, and I, I forget the order of the words, I'm not reading it, but when when you see those things, it's almost like a, a challenge. Okay, you have this, now you need to add this to it. As if we piecemeal Christ out. And if you look at those words, it is saying that those things are fully furnished. Fully furnished. As those who are partakers of the divine nature, all of those particular aspects of spiritual reality, basically the... Uh, you could say the characteristics of the one life of the spirit, which we'll get to uh, in, in this class to some degree, have been fully furnished if we are partakers of the divine nature, and that is Christ himself, the person of Christ. And if these things be in you and abound, they make that you be not barren or unfruitful. Why? Because he's the fruit. He is the full harvest. We've said it before that when we talk about the word, when Paul says the simplicity of Christ, the word the singleness, but in that word you can look it up in the Greek le in, in the Greek lexicons, and it it's a beautiful word because it not only means single, but it means full, abundant, abounding, fruitful, plentiful. As if God is saying that in the singleness of one, the full harvest is found. The full harvest and abundance of the intention of God, the fruit that in which he is fully delighted, is found in one. Thank God by his grace, that is the one who now abides in you. So, I, I'm trying not to get off on rabbit trails here. Um, so, so we shared this uh, with reference to Hebrews 7. Uh, Hebrews 7, 23, I'm reading this from the uh, Kenneth Weiss translation. You can read this in the King James. It's beautiful there as well, but I like this... Uh, a way he he words this but this priest again hebrews seven twenty three. but this priest because he is abiding forever has the priesthood which is untransferable for which reason also he is able to be saving completely and forever those who come to god through him being always alive for the purpose of continually making intercession for them and as I read that, and I continue, and I read this now, I just cannot get over that statement. The priesthood which is untransferable. 
for the reason that he is able to save completely and forever those who come to God through him. Man, this is a, it, this is a declaration of absoluteness, of, of certainty, of sufficiency, of full comprehensive salvation. I mean, first, it is stating that the priesthood of our great high priest, and we've dealt with the the picture and the testimony of the high priest in many different sessions together, that that the priesthood of our great high priest is untransferable. And, and what that means is that the entire reason and intention for there to ever have been a testimonial priesthood or a priesthood in testimony has reached this climax in this ever-living one. And this ever-living priest stands now in the presence of God for us as his intercession for us. It is not him pleading our case and pleading our problems and putting all that before God continually. But it is this one ever living in the sight of God as the life, as the righteousness, as the covenant, as the relationship of all who are found in him. See, that's uttermost salvation. That is I mean, look at this. He is able to save completely and forever those who... Does this... I mean, reading this statement, I mean, the King James would say, save to the uttermost. This says forever and completely. Does that sound in any of these words, regardless of the translation, like you have a determinate role in any of this? But to be a recipient of such sufficient grace? To be a soul in which this ever living, full and abundant one, this one who is, has received the climax of all testimonial priests, and stands as the priest that God had always intended, the one who stands there in his sight before his face as his beloved, as the one in whom his full and eternal delight is comprehensively realized. And that one stands there as my life, as your life, as my righteousness, as your righteousness. Can you imagine anything being greater than that? See, we're talking about the person here. We're talking about the reality of who he is in you. And that is the one that God desires to show a soul who will look for him. Who will merely set your affection to see and know and grow in this sufficient grace. A grace that overcomes all else. <laughs> a grace that has brought you from death unto life. We're talking about sufficiency here. This isn't something that comes and goes, that you slip in and slip out, that's, that's fragile. Something that keeps you in the midst of everything. The word uttermost. It's the numbers 3838 in the uh, Strong's. And it means full-ended or entire, complete. It is uh, a compound word, actually. To be brought to a full and complete end is, is the word uttermost. Beautiful. And it's a compound of the 3956, pause, pause. And that means the whole, um, thoroughly, all, everyone, 
the whole, all. And then the other word of that compound word is telos, which is a word that you should be very familiar with if you listen to these uh, podcasts. It's uh, 5056 in the Strong's, and it means the point or the goal aimed at as the limit or the conclusion of an act or a state, the result, the ending, the uttermost. Finally, it means those, it basically is where he, Jesus says, I am the end. The salvation to the uttermost is that you have been brought to the full end, the full, the all in the end himself. You have been brought to all things in the end himself. So we're going to talk about that as we're talking about being led of the Spirit. They are the sons of God in Romans 8. Because the word led means very close to this, but it means to be brought to, to be led to the ultimate destination. They are the sons of God. Well, guess what? If you are in him who is the telos, the end, the conclusion, the result himself, the amen of God, then you have by the Spirit been brought to the full and complete end of God's intent. It's found in this man who is now in you, the man in whom you are now found if you are born of his seed. This is another uh, word study here. This is the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament on that same word. And it says that um, in in uh, literature that this word means whole, full, perfect, um, supreme. It means actualized. That means something that's actual or real. And that it, it also means this, efficacious. What does that mean? Effectual or to have effect. Our salvation, because of who he is right now in us, is efficacious. It has effect. It is effectual. It's not waiting on anything else to make it effectual. He makes it effectual because he's present. And if he be present then there is effect, immediate effect. What is that effect? From death unto life, from darkness unto light, from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of the dear son, immediate effect or effectiveness or effectualness. Nothing else need happen to make it real or actualized. He is the actualization or the making real of it. Jameson Fawson Brown says this word to the uttermost means perfectly so that nothing should ever be wanting. It's amazing to me and unfortunate in my mind how we still have so many people, so many people proclaiming something still wanting, something still missing, something still lacking. When he's there, I'm talking to you from my heart tonight, guys. I want you to understand that when I'm sitting in front of this microphone, looking at these notes or looking at this computer in front of me, I'm not doing it for any other reason than because my heart desires to see as many as will. I 
as Paul said, obtain this salvation that has with it eternal glory. And when he said obtain, he didn't mean to get something that's not there. You can look at it in word studies. It means to experience something that's already happening. Experience something that's already taking place. So that you would live cognizant of a work that God is presently having already done, presently working in you, that you would enjoy this. But I cannot tell you there's something missing when there's not. All I can say is that in him, God has fully provided all things of life and godliness or giving to the soul all spiritual blessings. And again, that's not plural in the Greek. It's singular because again, the one is the whole. I can tell you you're lacking nothing and missing nothing and you've come short in nothing, no gift, no no um, bestowal of the grace of God, which is gift. You've, you've come behind in nothing as you are awaiting the appearing, the revelation of him. The revelation of him doesn't make it actual or efficacious. The revelation of him shows you how efficacious or effectual it truly, he truly is and has always been from the moment even before, but specifically for our salvation, the moment he came to reside within you. He brought about an absolute, a sure, and effectual salvation, a true and perfect relationship with God that in our ignorance we many times try to obtain, try to get, try to achieve because we do not comprehend this great gift that God has given. Robertson's words pictures to the uttermost. He says it's an old idiom in the New Testament only here. He says the Vulgate renders, renders it in perpetuum. This is possible, but the common meaning is completely and utterly. Perpetuum, what is that? It means perpetual, in perpetuity. I want you to see this. The salvation we have in Christ is a soul reaching the full end, the full culmination. Because it is actualized and effectual in the person of this one who appears in the presence of God for us. That is the one in whom and of whom it is said there is no condemnation. That life, that one standing there defining before God and in your soul a perfect salvation, a salvation without sin. Because it's a salvation that has nothing of that, nothing of that man, nothing of that creation, None of his deeds, none of his works, nothing his hand has ever touched as a reference point to that salvation. That's how great it is. That's how new it is. That's how unnatural or unearthly it is. It is of God and not of us. And then he goes on in Romans 8. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, this is verse 2, hath made me free from the law of sin and death. And let me just read verse 3. I don't know if we'll get to verse 3, but this we have to, I feel like we need to read. Well, every time I read it, I feel like we need to read the whole chapter together. But uh, the law of the spirit of life in Christ hath, may, hath made me free from the law of sin and death for what the law could not do. In that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Now, we'll stop there in the reading because I know that's about as far as we'd get if we even get that far. But here's verse 2. 
the law of the spirit of life, making me free, made me, hath. This is a past tense with present result. Present continual result. Remember, look at it. Saved us to the uttermost. The deliverance here spoken of is one that is already accomplished. It's, it's, it's represented here in these verses as, as a deliverance, as a work that is already accomplished. This is true. I, I put this commentary in here because while that statement is true, listen to what he does with it. He goes on and begins to uh, continue reasoning through this. This is uh, Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown. And some of their things is very good, but this this just misses it. Um, the deliverance here spoke of is represented as one already accomplished. Yes. Why? Because it is. This is true of the believer's deliverance from the law through the gospel. But listen, but, you see, he put a but on this. Paul doesn't. Paul doesn't put any buts or caveats or conditions on it. We do. Why? Because, and we do so because it sounds way too simple, way too easy, right? There's got to be more to it than that. This is true of the believer's deliverance from the law all through the gospel, but it is not true <clears throat> of his deliverance from indwelling corruption, which is a gradual process. The former, therefore, must give the true sense, and the latter not. See, this statement, this commentary, it misses the entire point. And I think entirely misses Paul's point in the previous chapter, chapter 7. And such a, such a thought keeps us dangling. And it, keeps dang, it dangles in front of us a promise, as if the presence of Christ within us does nothing but basically give us a framework for an ultimate deliverance from some inward corruption. But this is ludicrous in the light of the context and in the light of what Paul has been saying. The issue that has been overcome and from which Paul now declares freedom is the inward corruption or the inward condition of sin, death, and corruption. That's the whole point of Romans 7. It wasn't about what he was doing outwardly. It was always about there is something in me. There is a law in me. There is something in me that, that overrides Everything I do outwardly. What was that? An inward corruption, corruptibility. A law, a, a, the law of sin and death that was in me. That no matter what I did with my hands or with my body, no matter how much I gave myself to the observances of the law of God, the inward condition of corruption and vanity and sin and death could never be overcome by any of those efforts. And that's what Paul is describing deliverance from here. That's what he's saying he was delivered from. Not from just not doing bad things now. Not just I'm delivered from this law of Moses, thank God, but I'm still dealing with this old man. No, Romans 7 deals with both and makes them synonymous. That the dealing of the one is the dealing of the other. 
Being dead to one is being dead to the other. That now we have some kind of symbolic ceremonial liberty from the law through the gospel. But man, the real hard stuff comes as a process. It's amazing to me how much of that is still presented today as the truth, as the gospel. Do we not believe that the indwelling presence of the incorruptible seed has taken care of the corruption of a previous state of being? Listen, being born again, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, that's you naturally born, but of incorruptible, that's new birth. By the word of God who liveth and abideth forever. There's the one living and abiding forever, making intercession for us and doing what? Being the salvation to the uttermost. Being in me. The true deliverance from corruption and death and sin. That is, that is why dispensationalizing 1 Corinthians 15 is such a travesty. And that's why we can't dissect it into this and, you know, the first part of it and then the latter part of it and put dispensations in between the two. Because when he says that if Christ is not raised and you're still in your sins, that is the same thing as talking about these two men, one of the earth earthy and one who is the Lord from heaven, one who is the life-giving spirit that we're talking about now, the law of the spirit of life that has been given, and then talks about putting on uh, incorruption, corruption, putting on incorruptibility, mortal, putting on immortality. And we have people saying, yes, one day we're going to have these glorified bodies and we're going to be immortal. That's not it. He's talking about this salvation being born again of an incorruptible seed. The presence of the incorruptible seed has brought about an inward translation, an inward transition Now, if there's a gradual process or an ongoing process, it is the comprehending of the deliverance that God has already wrought in us by his own power. Now, uh, a commentary says here, the most plausible argument is that Romans 8.2 is intended to explain why there is no condemnation to believers. But so far as we understand it, the sense which Hodges, uh, another commentator, gives to Romans uh, 8 two makes it not an explanation, but a mere reiteration of the statement in Romans 8.1, only in another form. And I think it's important to point something out here. And I, I agree with that. I think it's it's not just explaining it, but it's it's kind of restating it. And I think this may clarify it. And it, it to me, it will clarify things as to an order. Um, and 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 Paul's presentation to the believers in Rome. If you look at chapter 7 and 8 of Romans, I believe we could actually take all of chapter 7 from verse 7 of chapter 7 to the end and just begin chapter 8 immediately after chapter 7, verse 6. So chapter 7 of Romans, verse 6 says, Now... Let me read in the King James here. Now we have been released, or I'm sorry, this isn't the King James, New America Standard. Now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Now, I believe from that you can... Take out all of the biographical part, and we'll say that, talk about that in a second, and just bring it from that very statement. Being released from the law, 
having died to that by which we're bound, you can jump right to Romans 8 and 1. There is therefore now no condemnation. I, I believe those two things can just go continue. I, and it's it's not that those verses after uh, Romans 7 verse 6 are not strategically placed because they are. Paul did that for a very specific reason, and we've talked about that many times. But they are placed there and intended to be a biographical look or warning, basically, to show how Paul was delivered from the law of the man of sin, and thus the law of Moses, to find exactly the very freedom and the victory that the Roman believers presently have in Christ. See what I'm saying? He's not saying this this struggle, and again, many of the headings of your Bibles will say the Christian struggle. He's not saying that this is the obligatory process, that this is a struggle that you're obligated to go through as a believer. He's declaring to them how what he was unsuccessfully unsuccessfully seeking under the law as one still born of a corruptible seed. They do not have to seek for because they have the full supply of all spiritual things because they are now in the spirit. They are now in the one wherein all things of life and godliness are given and gifted to the soul. So if we take out that biographical warning, we have a powerful declaration of the full deliverance and sufficiency of grace. Notice we have been freed from or been released from the law by having become dead to the law by which we were bound. So that now our service would be in the sphere or the confines of spirit, being now indwelt by the life of which the letter demanded or the life which the law letter or the law demanded but never provided. That's the great difference here. The law, one, that law that is the law of Moses, is outside of us, was outside of man, was outside of man describing a life that would come and be in you. But the new, the life of the Spirit, the law of the life of the Spirit, is that one now being in you, living in you as the fullness and fulfilling of every word and implication of the letter. See, the letter killeth because the letter, although testifying of a perfect man, keeps one who would apply it to himself, still keeps that one in the realm of death. Because perfect adherence to law was never the intention of the law. The law always had a perfect spiritual implication. The law had a life in view. And that's why the letter kills, but what? The Spirit gives. Look at that word. The Spirit gives life. That's what has happened. He has not left us just servants of a letter, applying it to ourselves, trying to make it work. It was never intended to work that way. It was never intended to bring you to that type of perfection. It was intended to bring your soul to the perfect one. That you could be found in him having nothing of your own. My God, that is the liberty. That is the deliverance we're talking about here. Found in him having nothing of our own. That is the liberty, the deliverance, the true freedom that the laws, the, the, the spirit's life in us has brought. The law of a life, not an outward law that we just apply to flesh, but an inward law governing 
inwardly. What we cannot miss here is that the liberty is stated to be through being dead to the former binding influence. Romans 6.18 says, being then made free from sin, you become the servants of righteousness. See, read this now in the context of the realm of service, that we would no longer serve in the oldness of the letter, but in the newness of the spirit. Now read Romans 6.18 in view of that. Being made free from sin, you become the servants of righteousness. You are... Now made free from sin. So that now your service, your servitude, your enslavement. We've talked about that. The in, the liberty of our enslavement. We talked about that several classes ago. So that now our service would be in the realm of spirit. Where righteousness is not something to be accomplished but someone who is the accomplishment of it all in you. Our service is not to achieve or to accomplish anything, but to live in accordance and in recognition of who he is. But now being made free from sin, this is verse 22 of Romans 6, and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness in the end everlasting life. Now, listen to these words. This is from Galatians chapter 4, verse 31 through chapter 5, verse 2. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman. Remember the distinction he's making between Hagar and Sarah in the testimony and showing them to be that which is of the, of the law and that which is of faith or that which is the flesh and that which is the spirit. Stand fast. We are not of the ch- we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. See, being entangled again is to seek to find in that realm of bondage, that realm of flesh and sin, death and corruption, what God has already fully bestowed in the realm of your liberty, the realm who is Christ himself. This is the liberty of this enslavement. This is the liberty of servitude to God. I am crucified with Christ. There is life, but it is not I. But Christ liveth in me. This is the liberty that has been provided to the soul through the presence of the life of the Spirit himself. This is the liberty. It is for liberty that he, some translations will say, it is for this liberty that he has made you free. Stand fast in this liberty. Let me just say this. We hear a lot in Christianity about being dead and to the world, being dead to sin. Maybe this may help somebody. I, I feel like it might. Some of you may not like it. <laughs> but being dead to the world, being dead to sin, It's not the same. It's not about at all being dead to little Johnny's soccer game. So you don't go see him play soccer because that's not a spiritual exercise and you're dead to that. Or that you're dead to the world so you can't travel with your friends to enjoy time with them. I hate how we have decimated the reality of being dead to the world, free from sin, by playing these games with it and presenting our own natural proclivities, our own inclinations as spiritual conduct. So whatever inclination we may personally have, we have our ways of twisting it to make that particular thing 
spiritual in its nature. And we not only do that and delude ourselves, we make that an aspect of the gospel and make that the goal for people to achieve or to strive for, to not do those things because that proves you're dead to the world. It has nothing to do with that. Because being dead to the world, to sin, is the result of being alive within the confines of an altogether other and opposing reality, meaning from death unto life. has nothing to do with little Johnny's soccer game. If you don't want to go to a soccer game, don't go. Just don't make that spiritual because you're too spiritual to go. And I may get hate mail from this or just get people leaving. That's fine. But this is how final and ultimate or uttermost our salvation is, from death unto life. You hear those words? From death unto life. That's the same as saying, the law of the spirit of life hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Same thing. See, the, unfortunately, we've made it as juvenile and as pedestrian as, hey, I don't smoke anymore. See, I don't, I'm not endorsing smoking at all. I remember hearing some guy say one time, he said, smoking won't send you to hell. It'll just only make you smell like you've been there. But <laughs> putting that aside, the lack of smoke is not the reference point for righteousness. The presence of Christ is. And he abides. Even if smoke is still there. And you better rejoice in that. I'm finding a great deal of enjoyment in knowing these things. <laughs> and understanding this finally. After years of frustration. After years of trying to measure up to some something that was never in my grasp because he's the full measure of it all. And I now rejoice in it because even if smoking or something like that is not your particular fleshly issue, you do have some of your own. Even if you don't want anyone else to know about it, you do, and God does. And I'm telling you, his presence is greater than your issue and your brother's issue. Now let me say something and make it very clear here. Because I do not want to be mis misunderstood, and I do not want to be further misrepresented by those who may not like what I say. I'm not saying we rejoice in our ignorance. That's not what I'm saying at all. I don't say we rejoice in our natural, earthly silliness. I've plainly stated that ignorance can never dismantle the reality that God has provided, but it does impede a soul from the enjoyment of that reality. Absolutely. To say that I rejoice in ignorance with regard to spiritual reality is absurd. And the preaching of such absoluteness as I'm doing in this study is not so that we can rejoice in our ignorance and say, we've got it, it doesn't matter if we're ignorant or not. That's not it. However, listen to me very clearly. I do rejoice in the fact that in the midst of my immense ignorance of his eternal sufficiency within, he yet keeps my soul securely anchored in a perfect and unadulterated fellowship with himself. I trust that you do understand that no matter what you are now seeing of Christ presently, your soul remains greatly ignorant of him in so many ways. I hope you do know that. See, we're always just scratching the surface I remember Brother Spark saying, writing one time that we are always standing 
always standing on the shore of a great, vast ocean called Christ, and we are always scratching the surface of him. I remember him telling me, speaking into my heart specifically one time in Costa Rica, and he said, no matter how much of me you have seen, there will never be less of me to see. Now I'm telling you, in the light of such a thing, such a statement, such a reality, you can never tell me there is something of him of which you are not ignorant. We are always scratching the surface. So knowing that, In the midst of my dullness of understanding, his understanding, his grace, and his presence is effectual to keep me and to simultaneously carry me within the confines of his perfection, to show me all that he is so that I may know the length and the breadth and the depth of this great love of God that has been bestowed. This is the love from which Paul will say in this very chapter of Romans, nothing can separate us. This is the love of Galatians 2.20. He loved us and gave himself for us. I trust that those of you who do not think you know all there is, will go away from such a declaration as you're hearing right now with a great sense of thanksgiving to the God of all sufficient grace. See, this is the reality of this liberty that we've come to. Dead to one state of being by being found in and born of a life who brings in an altogether new state of being or a new condition. To more clearly find this liberty or de- define this liberty, I think we can use Paul's words. Galatians chapter 6, verse 15 and 16. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. See, this is very close. Peace be on them. This is very close to Romans 8 when he will say, to be earthly minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. See, I dealt with this many episodes ago that neither circumcision nor uncircumcision availeth but a new creation or a new creature. Liberty is not from one earthly inclination to what is now perceived to be a more spiritual inclination. Liberty is the soul being delivered from the sphere where any of those particular things are the point of reference at all. By bringing us into the one who alone avails. It's not choosing between the two or choosing the best one out of the two, whether circumcision or uncircumcision. Oh, I don't believe in circumcision anymore. I believe you must be uncircumcised to be spiritual. And Paul's saying, no, neither one of those things matter. They are both earthly distinctions that have nothing to do with anything of reality. And yet the majority of us are still bound to some earthly distinction, some earthly evidence or proof. Or at least we're looking for it. It's not choosing the one or the other, but being delivered from both of them. By being found in the one in whom neither Not one earthly distinction has any relevance at all. It is an altogether new creation where all things are of God and not of us. Brother called me a few weeks ago and he made a wonderful statement to me and I I wanted to share it with you. He said, I've heard you say many times 
that we have not been given our own relationship with God, but we have been given Christ's relationship with the Father or Christ himself as our relationship with the Father. And if that is so, we also, seeing that Christ is our life, we have also Christ's relationship with sin, with death, corruption, etc. And that is absolutely correct. And that's what Romans 6 is all about. The reality that God wrought in Christ for those of us who are baptized into Christ is also now wrought in us through his indwelling presence. And that reality that is now present must now be reckoned inwardly or recognized inwardly by the revealing of that one. See? It's a recognition of being dead to sin and alive unto God through Christ Jesus. Meaning it is not of ourselves. This is through him, not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. Here's Jesus describing his work. John chapter 5, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is past, is past, from death unto life. What are we looking at? Romans 8, 2. The law of the spirit of life hath freed me from the law of sin and death. This is a life that brings about this liberty. It's not achievements, accomplishments, it's the presence of life. Remember, uh, we it was in uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 18, Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life, or, as we've read in the literal translation, a righteousness that has to do with life that lines up specifically with Galatians chapter three, where it says that the law, if it could have given the life that it declared or that it demanded, then righteousness would have been by the law showing you that righteousness and this life, divine life, spiritual life are one in the same meaning in life, Righteousness resides or abides. See, righteousness is the result of the presence of life himself. I love this. Proverbs 11. Let me read it first. Proverbs 10, verse 2. Proverbs 10, verse 2 says, Treasures of wickedness profit nothing, but righteousness delivereth from death. Listen to that. Righteousness delivereth from death. Proverbs 11, 4, riches profit not in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivereth from death. See, this, these proverbs describe the overcoming and sufficient power of righteousness, not as an aspect of spiritual living, some kind of a characteristic we grow into, but as the life of the spirit himself. Now, Read this in the context of Romans 8, 1 through 4. Righteousness is not a divine characteristic that results from successful adherence to religious constructs or commands. You have to realize that Paul is plainly stating that righteousness is an intrinsic aspect of one particular life that God has freely gifted to the soul in grace. The law or righteousness, or I'm sorry, the life or righteousness is also by Paul personified in the person of the seed who is Christ. And the portion of Proverbs that we've just read states the same thing that we're reading in Romans 7, 25 through Romans 8 through 4. The righteousness that delivers us from death is the righteousness that arrives as the life of the perfect seed himself. It is as partakers of his life within, 
which is his righteousness, his holiness, his sanctification, his wisdom, his fullness, and his perfection, that our soul is delivered from death. The sin and death under which the previous state enslaved us or the previous condition or state of being in Adam enslaved us. This state of death described here is not physical in its nature. It speaks of an incapacity toward relationship with God through the lack of the life to which God himself relates. We do not get delivered because we achieve righteousness. We are delivered through the indwelling of the person of righteousness. Notice this. This deliverance, this liberty from the law of sin and death is the result of God gifting the son of his love to the soul and making him to be unto us the righteousness of God fulfilled. This is 1 Corinthians 15, declaring this one who now abides in your soul as the life-giving spirit. This is why his being raised is synonymous with our salvation. If he's not raised, you're still in your sin. For deliverance is brought about through the presence of the life of the living one, the life of the man who is spirit, who has no relation at all with that of the earth. Remember, just again to remind you concerning the efficacy of this life, when he says he saves us to the uttermost as our great high priest, that means that This salvation that he now is within us, the salvation that he stands in the presence of God as and lives in us as is actualized, is effectual, is perfect and full. That's what that word means to the uttermost. Perfect as there should be nothing wanting, nothing lacking, nothing missing. In this Romans 5.10, this is the same thing. The law of the spirit of life, making me free from the law of sin and death. In Romans 5.10, for if being enemies, we have been reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved in his life. That's young literal translation, in his life. Now, this is, I didn't read this. This is the, this is the Weiss translation of this, Romans 5, 18. So then, therefore, as through one act of transgression to all men there resulted condemnation, thus all through, also through one act of righteousness to all men there resulted a righteous standing that had to do with life. That's it, life. This liberty, this freedom, this deliverance, It's because of the presence of life. I am come that they might have the life and have it in abundance. He that hath the Son hath the life. He that hath not the Son hath not the life. Wow, how simple, how beautiful. He makes the difference. He determines everything. Death is determined by the absence of him. Death is the absence of him. Life is the presence of him. Sin is the absence of him. Righteousness is the presence of him. You're not in this picture as a determining factor. You are the recipient of grace or you are dead in your sin. Romans 5.18, this is the Weymouth translation. There's some problems with this translation, but I do like this. It follows then that just as the result of a single transgression is a condemnation which extends to the whole race, so also the result of a single decree of righteousness 
is a life-giving acquittal. I hate that word. But this, this phrase, single decree of righteousness, I do like that from the Weymouth translation. A single decree of righteousness. This is not a... This is not a decree or declaration of our righteousness, but is the one decreed righteous being in us the righteousness of God. That's stated in Romans 3. Verse 25, to whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. You could say the mercy seat, the propitiatory um, shelter, one translation says, through faith in his blood to declare, listen, to declare his righteousness, not to declare you righteous. See, that's what we think. That's what we're after. No, this is all about declaring his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, that he might be righteous or declared, seen to be, made known to be righteous, and the justifier or the righteousness Of him which believeth in Jesus. Same thing. One single decree of righteousness. And that one single decree of righteousness is the declaration of the one life who God has given to the soul in grace. And I love the way he says it here. This is the Murdoch translation. Um, there's some parts here I like in the space, which God in his long surfing gate does for the manifestation of his righteousness at the present time. This is again, Romans three twenty six in the Murdoch translation that he might be righteous and might with righteousness, justify him who is in the faith of the Lord Jesus Messiah. I like that might with righteousness make righteous. That's the same thing as a while ago we said, with freedom he has made us free. That's showing it is his power making so what can never be so otherwise and in the most comprehensive and sufficient manner. It's it's just him. It's, it's It's who he is. And in the light of that, in Romans 3, what we're just reading, he would say, where is your boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? By law of works, Romans 7? No, but by the law of faith. Now tell me, is the law of faith not the same as the law of the spirit of life? How many laws we got floating around here? It is this life. This law of life, this law of faith that excludes all room for any earthly boasting because it is this life that brings into the soul a salvation without reference to that man or that realm of sin. And those who look for that man, that perfect man, those who look for him and set the heart and the affection on that one, on that life which is above, shall he appear. And he shall make himself known as that sinless and sufficient salvation, as the life of all who believe. I pray to God for each of us, that our hearts would yearn and long for God to reveal his son. 
not because we believe that that will make something sure, but because he is the sureness of it all. And our soul wants to know him. Not because we think if we don't see, then we lack something. No, but we want to see him who is full, sufficient, and perfect, who is the full bestowal of grace. I just want you to just to hear how great he is. And if he's great, then guess what? The salvation that he is in you is great. The deliverance is a great deliverance that he has wrought. Remember, we talked about it. With Joseph and his brothers. He reveals himself to show them that he is the one who wrought such a great deliverance. But they were eating and living because he had already wrought such a great deliverance, he just makes known that it is him who is the source of such a deliverance. He was their deliverance. And he could not contain himself. Read it there. He could not refrain. He could not re- could not hold back any longer because he desired to show himself to his brother to his brethren, and make known to them that he is the one that brought about such a great deliverance. I'm telling you, it is a great salvation that we now have. I'm just praying to God for you that you would set your heart to see him. This is not so that you would assess yourself to see if you're, you know, pressing in hard enough or trying hard enough to see Jesus. Just go before the Lord and say, open my eyes. He is coming to you right now as if he, as he did with the blind man and saying, what would you have me do? Because you have had enough sense to say, have mercy on me, son of David. And now he stands before you. Now he is before you. Now he's in you saying, what would you have me do? Go before him and say, I want to see. I don't want anything because you're everything in me. And if this crazy man on this podcast is right, You've provided all things of spiritual fullness. You are spiritual fullness presently in me. I just want to see. I just want to know who you are. I want to know you as you are. I want to be aware of this sufficiency of this perfection. I want you to guide my soul and show me the full dimensions of his excellency. I've said before in a class, and I'll I'll end it here. You never proceed beyond where you begin. Paul says it, having begun in the spirit, you never will ever, ever proceed beyond where you begin. This is not about getting more or getting somewhere else. It's about beholding where you are. Because where you are is a place replete with spiritual fullness, with divine perfection. with an incorruptible, all-sufficient, comprehensively perfect life. 
Now may the Father reveal that life. That we may know the greatness of our great salvation. Thank you so much for taking your time to listen to this seemingly now extended version of this podcast. Until next time. Amen.